Okay. You, so you thank don't you. need any mic. <laughs> thank you for uh, the invitation. I'm very honored to be there. And uh, I will try to explain you a little bit uh, what type of research we conduct in my lab and uh, more specifically in my research team. So it's about images. So we'll see that it's medical images, robots and humans because uh, it's uh, with a, a close interaction with the clinicians. And of course, there are patients which are generally not so far from uh, what we do. OK, so just a, a few mm. words about uh, my lab. I will not go into the details of CNRS, something like that. You know this very well. Something really important to remember is that we are a lab which is uh, really located near the hospital in the hospital uh, room the hospital campus and therefore we have really tight connection uh, with clinicians and some of the, uh, the, the permanent people of the lab, some of them are clinicians also and we have also many co uh, collaboration with uh, different teams in surgery, radiotherapy, radiology and so on. And something also interesting is that we uh, welcome also PhD students which are clinicians so we have both uh, PhD students which are more standard uh, students and we have also PhD cl uh, clinician which are resident or even people with, with, which are already uh, in position in the hospital and this makes really the collaboration uh, very tight. So in the lab there are people which are closer to biology and health stuff and there are people which are closer to math, informatics and robotics and I am more in that group. And uh, my team uh, is about 45 people. Uh, we, we are about uh, 15 permanent people and the rest of uh, uh, doctoral student, PhD, engineers and so on. Okay, so let's go now to the uh, topic of my talk. So it's about computer assisted medical intervention. So there will be plenty of medicine. I'm sorry for those who don't like so much the, the medical stuff, but uh, since uh, we really make a research very applied, uh, of course, I will explain a little bit of the applications. Otherwise, it will be uh, difficult to explain what we do. So the, the, the team was created something like 30 years ago. It was really at a time where very few people were involved in that field. And the, the focus is really to help the surgeon or the clinician more generally to make something uh, with a safer condition, with more precision. It may be both diagnostic uh, intervention or treatments, as you will see. And uh, uh, a very important component of uh, what we do relates to image processing and how you can use in a very quantitative way those images, how you can fuse information from different sources because of course you get many information from your patient but you have also things coming from atlases, from statistical models, from biomechanical models and so on. And this is to be used for planning some intervention. So you will see it may be more or less uh, automatic. Sometimes you will see for radiotherapy treatment, for instance, the problem is to uh, deliver a certain dose of uh, X-ray of radiation to a certain region of the body of a patient. And in the same uh, time, you want to um, restrict as much as possible the dose delivery to other, or other regions or organ at risk. So it's kind of an optimization uh, problem that you can solve automatically, but sometimes you need some simulation, you need some uh, biomechanical model to make the planning, and so that involves many, uh, many components here. And at the end, what you want is to provide an assistant to the clinician, and you will see that we have different types of assistants. One are likes your GPS, it's uh, what we call navigation systems, and some other are uh, robots, so which may be more or less autonomous, and we will see examples. So those components may be also useful for providing assistance for educational purpose and for evaluation of uh, what you do. Okay. So this domain, in fact, uh, you, you see uh, it's a kind of a history, a condensed history of uh, when the, the domain has de emerged, let's say in the mid of the uh, 80s. 
and it, it really results from many different evolutions in many different disciplines. Of course, medicine has really evolved for very long, for thousands of uh, years, but even uh, two centuries ag uh, ago, people started to want to make examination of the intern uh, of the inside of the patient without opening so the the first system for endoscopy you see uh, were invented at that time and people after try to make uh, things less invasive more precise you see this uh, device it's for what is called stereotactic neurosurgery that means that you want to reach a particular region in the brain and this device that was invented here is a kind of uh, reference frame that was useful to, to be able to go to the right place. Of course, physics has provided many things related to imaging, the discovery of X-ray, of magnetic resonance, of ultrasounds, and so on. And of course, the use of this system for medical imaging was made also possible because informatics has developed and you could be able to uh, reconstruct images in 3D uh, thanks to that. Last component is uh, related to robotics. So we have, uh, we, we like to name Vauconçon in Grenoble because he, he is born in, in, uh, in Grenoble and he has developed the first automaton. And of course, uh, robotics has arrived uh, later, about in 1950, were the first industrial robots, but you will see the first medical robot here. It's, uh, we, we will come back on that, but it was a, a press uh, paper from New York Times in 85 uh, about a robot for neurosurgery. And you see, really, this domain, I, I like this slide because it shows that it's a, a collection of domains. It's not a single thing that uh, allows to make this kind of application, but the collection of many different disciplines with people with many different competencies that allows to provide those computer-aided medical intervention systems. So uh, we'll not go in, in those details. Uh, this is just to, uh, to show once again that it's uh, pluridisciplinary or interdisciplinary. You have to deal with the sampling, with image processing. Uh, you can develop sensors. For instance, here it's a sensor that we developed to, uh, uh, to be able to determine the uh, elasticity of the brain uh, organ in order to be able to make some biomechanical simulation, which is patient-specific. Uh, patient you need to have biomechanical models. You can predict in this way, for instance, here the deformation of the brain when you perform certain intervention. You can have a simulation device. Here I show that uh, the, the important component of uh, what is called registration, so the correspondence between different modalities of image or the correspondence uh, between different pieces of information. For instance, here you see in that example, it's uh, okay, you have a CT scan of a patient and you have a biomechanical model of a face of some, somebody else. And what you want is to be able to deform this model, which is kind of generic, to the data of your patient, to be able to have a patient-specific biomechanical model that you can use. For instance, here it was for planning some craniofacial surgery. Okay. Uh, as I said, you have different types of uh, assistance. So some of them are navigation system and some of them are robotics. You don't see very much, but you will see example after. So let's go uh, back to the beginning of the story. You see the first system that were developed were for stereotactic neurosurgery. So as I, as I said, stereotactic neurosurgery, okay, you have a patient and you have a brain and you want to go somewhere here, of course you have to avoid vessels and, and critical region. And in fact, you have to plan a trajectory and access to that place. In general, these uh, surgeries are mini-invasive. It's something like two, two millimeter uh, diameter. But of course, the difficulty is to drill the hole at the right place with the right orientation to bring the tool uh, in position. 
So as you can see, first system were developed and uh, published here uh, in the US. It was a system where uh, an industrial robot was used carrying a laser beam and it was in connection with a CT scan. So from the CT scan, you could plan a position like this. And afterwards, the, the laser beam of the robot shows the trajectory of the surgeon that makes the surgery. So that was the first uh, experiment of uh, medical robotics, surgical robotics, and they have made a few number of patients because it was really not a robot specific for uh, cl uh, clinical application. In Grenoble, uh, people developed a robot also for neurosurgery, but in the operating room. And instead of having here a laser beam, you know it's a mechanical guide. Uh, so it is connected to image processing so that you can plan your trajectory in a suitable way by using both MR, CT, X-ray images. Excuse me, what is CT? Computer uh, scanner, computed tomography. It means by X-ray? Yeah, it's X-ray. So the 3D, uh, this kind of... Uh, this kind of image like that. It's a, you get slice of the patient, yeah. okay? And based on x-rays. <coughs> okay, here you use also some other imaging from the, the operating room, and here the robot place in position this uh, mechanical guide, and again the, the clinician use this to direct his tool. So you see in those two cases, uh, the robot does not make anything, it just shows the trajectory. Here it shows it using light, so you can drill uh, in another direction because it does not uh, oblige you to follow the trajectory. Here it's a mechanical guide, so you are obliged to follow the trajectory, but you still do the gesture. And last example, people from APFL developed sometimes uh, later a robot that was uh, made uh, to do everything, so not only positioning the tool, but also drilling the skill and getting to the right position. So, okay, it's a choice, but you can imagine that in this case, safety issues are much bigger, because if the, uh, the robot has to drill the skill, he has to stop just before getting to the surface of the brain, so you need to develop really uh, force sensing and very precise thing so that you stop uh, that at the right uh, moment. And uh, we thought that in our case it was not really interesting to do that because it's the thing that the, the clinician is uh, perfectly able to do by himself. What is difficult in that uh, application for the clinician is to drill the thing at the right position. So it's really a positional aspect which is interesting, not a tactile or, or a gesture thing. So, so this is really to, to introduce you the fact that what we uh, want to do, at least in my lab, is really to develop, to put robots for functions that the clinician is not able to do perfectly. But there are many things he's able to do, and so in that case it's not necessary to automate this. Okay, second types of system developed. So first systems were developed also on, in neurosurgery and in orthopedics. Those were the, the two main uh, domains in which people worked for long. And here, for instance, it's for uh, placing screws in vertebra, for instance, when people have a severe scoliosis or different pathology. And so you, uh, you take a CT scan, you have to extract information from that. You can construct a 3D model of the vertebra. And during the surgery, you see here there is a sensor, which is a kind of GPS based on a camera, which is able to track instrument and can track also structures, anatomical structures. And therefore, what you see here in yellow, in fact, it's the planned trajectory that has been prepared previously here, and in blue, uh, what you see is the real trajectory. And so what the, uh, the, the system does, it, it computes in real time based on the actual position of the instrument where the instrument will go through the vertebra. 
And these three views are something that the clinicians are very used to. It's three orthogonal views. So you have uh, one which is sagittal like that, one axial like that, and one frontal like that. So based on these three views, they are able to see if the tool goes in the right uh, direction. Because here, the danger, you see the vertebra. Here, it's an no, no horizontal view. Here, it's the medulla. You have nerves, vessels, and if you are wrong with your uh, trajectory, you can have severe consequences. And the canal here, which is called the pedicle, uh, vertebral <coughs> pedicle, is something which is difficult to see in 3D uh, when you open your patient. And especially where people have scoliosis, they have big deformities of vertebra, so it's, it makes it very uh, uh, difficult. So here is navigation. It's like you're in your car. It tells you where you are and where you should go, but afterwards you can do what you want. It's what we call passive assistance. So for uh, many years, in fact, people have worked on uh, bones. So brain is not a bone, of course, but it was uh, considered for very long that it was mini invasive surgery with uh, small holes to access uh, the, 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 um, the brain through the skull. And so people considered that uh, there were no deformation on the brain. And so from very long, people developed assistance where well, you consider that your target has a static position, it's quite easy. Let's say easy, it's always easy when you know how to do that, but uh, uh, it, uh, you can handle that. Uh, you can make a planning on preoperative data and afterwards, provided that you have some guidance, it's easy to assist the clinician. Now, if you move to soft tissue, for instance, here is a liver. Okay, you breathe, so your liver is moving like that and is deformed. If you make surgery, of course, everything deforms also. And so you not only have to track uh, rigid things, but you have to deal with mobile and deformable targets. And therefore, if you plan something, for instance, uh, you plan a liver surgery, as soon as you start uh, making the surgery, opening the patient, your planning is no longer correct. And so you have to update this based on sensors, based on models, based on synchronization of your tools to the, to the movement of your, your, your target. And so that makes the things much more uh, difficult. So concerning uh, robotics, people uh, changed a little bit uh, their mind at that time, because in the first stage, when people consider soft, uh, rigid structures like bones, it was in fact like a machining. When you machine a surface, okay, you, uh, you, you have to be precise and so on. You have a plan, you execute it. But if now your, the organs moves, are deformed, you cannot reason uh, about automation. So people developed system for teleoperation. You can see the first system were developed here for the, these robots carry, uh, some of them carry instruments, some of them carry uh, what is called an endoscope. An endoscope is a camera which allows to see inside uh, the body without opening it and being able to, uh, to, to make the surgery. And so when you perform, so uh, laparoscopy, it's a surgery where let's imagine that it's uh, the, the, the belly of the, the patient and you, you make small, okay, you want to operate something here and you make some small holes and you introduce instrument in the body like that. And as I said, you introduce also a camera And so you can see here your instrument and your organ, and the clinician uh, has to operate using this, uh, this view and carrying this instrument. And you can imagine that when you uh, insert your instrument by this uh, kind of uh, orifice, you lose some degrees of freedom. Instead of having six degrees of freedom like uh, uh, for free movement, here you only have four, and so you lose dexterity of course, you lose perception because you see in 2D, you cannot palpate the things, and so robot can be useful to provide assistance. And so it's why people provided these kind of systems based on teleoperation. So it's 
you, you propose uh, with a joystick or something, a motion to be executed by the robot and the robot execute exactly what you show. So there is no level of automation. What made uh, this system very popular <coughs> was that it was voice controlled. So the clinician could uh, give order to the, to the system to move left or right or whatever. Okay, and after people, okay, you have light version of that. We developed that in Grenoble, which is a lighter version of this system, also controlled uh, by uh, voice. And those are more recent system, which not only carry uh, cameras, but also instrument. It's uh, the Da Vinci system. The, the clinician operating the patient is here. He, he see the internal, uh, the, the inside of the patient through 3D vision system, here stereo vision. And he has uh, some joystick, which makes uh, makes possible the control of the instrument which are on these uh, robotic arms. And what is also very important in this system is that you see the, the instrument like that, they are, uh, they are articulated inside the patient. So here you had only four degrees of freedom and with that you get the two that you have naturally with open surgery. So you, you get some, uh, uh, some dexterity again. Okay, so that's uh, the state of the art. Many uh, uh, hospitals worldwide have system like that. Uh, people try, uh, however, to, to change a little bit the way they could control robot. Okay, you can have autonomous system, teleoperated one. And what people try to do also, what is called co-manipulation, you see the, the paradigm here. The instrument is on a robot and the clinician holds the instrument also and tries to move it and only some of the, uh, of the movements are authorized by the robot. For instance, here it's for uh, removing uh, bones in the knee of a patient to, uh, to, to be able to place uh, a component of a prosthesis. And so with the, the, the human operator can uh, uh, remove the, the, the bone here, but the limits of this resection is controlled by the robot. So it's really interesting because you get the dexterity of the operator, but you have uh, some information which is given by the robot from some plan planning to be able to constrain the gesture. After more recently, people have tried to, uh, to develop again uh, automation for soft tissues by what is called visual severing. So that means that, okay, you want to automate the, the update of a trajectory based on some images. For instance, here it's for radiotherapy treatment where the, the system for radiotherapy is here, is carried by a big robot and using several images, both x-rays and tracking uh, abilities, the robot is able to adapt uh, the position of the, the machine with respect to the breathing of the patient. So for instance, if you want to make a radiation of the lung because the guy has a cancer, uh, cancer of the lung, uh, the robot will be able to, to, to adapt to the position of the target in real time, okay? So in fact, concerning robotics, you see there have been uh, very uh, different types of, of evaluation, both concerning the clinical applications. So from bones with open surgery to more minimally invasive surgery, then to what is called laparoscopic, what I have drawn here. And finally, what is called endoluminal under surgery, where you even don't uh, make incision, but you try to uh, go through, for instance, the stomach to, to go in the abdomen or through the vagina of women if you want to go to the abdomen. So it's uh, much more uh, mini invasive, but at that time you, you have very flexible instrument and it's very difficult to control them by hand. And so you need some level of automation. So as I said, the, the automation can be okay, uh, full for the be beginning, 
based on uh, visual information and you have other uh, type of interaction with the user. And after concerning the architecture of the robot, people started with uh, robots that came from uh, the industrial world, they adapted to it, and afterwards they developed some specific devices some of them you could put them onto the patient and some of them you can even uh, insert them in the body of the patient. For instance, here it's a, a system, uh, it, you, you see it's very small, uh, it's a fingerprint here, and you insert it in the eye to be able to, to inject something in the vessels of the retina and the motion of this device is controlled by some uh, electromagnetic fields from the outside. So you can go to a certain level of miniaturization to put the things into the body of patient. Okay, so let's come back to, uh, to the, uh, the issues related to soft tissues. So as I said, you have to, to make real-time acquisition of data, processing, data fusion, also simulation in some cases to uh, predict uh, motion and deformation, and you need to uh, be able to track. Of course, there are safety and reliability issues which are also a big. To uh, illustrate a little bit more an example, it's more, uh, it concerns more men than women, but uh, that's prostate. Uh, so uh, I will describe you a few, uh, few works related to, to prostate uh, cancer. And so first of all, I will uh, give you some, uh, remind you or introduce you to some uh, basic things. So the prostate is here, you know, it's like a big nut. Uh, there is the, oh, excuse me, there is a bladder here, the rectum here, and the prostate has different zone, and the cancer is mostly located in the peripheral zone. It's a cancer which is very frequent for men, so you have the, you have the numbers, but you see in France it's a, it's uh, the third cancer in men after lung and colon rectum, and it's a cancer which is uh, interesting, is not the, the suitable word, but it's a cancer where you will see there are plenty of diagnosis uh, possibilities, and when it is diagnosed, there are plenty of treatments. So that's really interesting to develop assistance to, for this uh, type of diagnosis or uh, treatment, because it concerns many patients. Okay, so uh, concerning the diagnostic, uh, we will speak more about histology. Histology is uh, the end, let's say, the end of the story when there is a suspicion of cancer because you have some blood sampling with a rising PSA or something else, and you will bring some samples of the tissue to examine them and see how, if they are cancerous cells or not. And after treatment, there are many, most of them, um, uh, not most, but you see a large part of them are surgery. It can be radiotherapy, it can be brachytherapy. We'll be, we will speak a little bit of that also. So uh, there are many possibilities of imaging the prostate. For the uh, diagnostic, MRI is uh, preferred. And in general, there are different types of uh, uh, sequences of uh, MRI, and it's the combination of those different sequences that makes the diagnostic possible. Uh, you have also the use of uh, ultrasound. Uh, you will see that many gestures are guided by ultrasound. So here you see the prostate in here. And something really interesting and more recent is the use of elastography. Uh, that means that using a special kind of ultrasound, you can uh, recover the elasticity parameter of the organs. And what is interesting uh, uh, is that, in general, the, the zone with the cancer are uh, more rigid than the other tissue, and so you can be guided uh, using that. Okay, I don't go in uh, so much of detail, but there are some uh, uh, surgeries. So you have endoscopic images, and for radiotherapy, you have to, uh, to use CT. So there are traditional uh, way of uh, using these images. So what is the issue with that prostate is that it moves a lot. And you can see here, so it was the same patient for which we collected many CT exams. 
and this, the CT exam were uh, superimposed using the bone information that you see, the white region here, the sacrum, the pelvic bones, and so on. And the prostate is here. You see here it's uh, the horizontal uh, slice, and here is the profile slice, so again the prostate is here. And you see that from one session to the other, the prostate is a different position. And you can even uh, see, I don't know, can I, maybe I will go back to that. Uh, okay, if you look uh, to this, it's an MRI sequence and the prostate is here and it's a dynamic sequence and you even see that during breathing the prostate uh, naturally moves and so it's very difficult. If you plan something, you have to consider that to be able to adapt to these motions. About the movie of the X-ray scanning, you have a, pe you have a period between the slides. Okay. Uh, here it's uh, for a, a, a patient that had some radiotherapy treatment, so I think they, they made a CT each day or something like that. Okay, so this is not a movie uh, which no, is no, close it's to a, real time. It's, here it's a real time. Yeah. Uh, the MRI is uh, real time, so it's during a certain, uh, I don't know, uh, 20 seconds, you see how it moves, but here it's from one session okay. of radiotherapy to this is following one you have okay, different you. okay and that's important because for very long people when they uh, prepare the treatment for radiotherapy for prostate they use the pelvic bones as a referential to position the patient and so you see that if you do that okay the pelvic bones are always at the same place but the, the thing that you want to irradiate has moved from time to time. So you need another technique to do that. So the clinician have plenty of expectation uh, uh, related to that. They want to uh, increase the quality of the diagnosis, having less false positive or false negative. Improve also uh, the knowledge about where is the cancer, because depending of the way that uh, the fact that it is very uh, focused or large, you will not treat the patient in the same way. Okay, this will help you making the decisions and after the treatment, you will also improve uh, both. You need to improve uh, the way you cure the patient, but also you need something for prostate ca uh, cancer when you treat it. Very often there are uh, undesired <coughs> effects related to incontinence, impotence, and so on. And so you want to reduce as much as possible this. So I will just uh, show you the type of work that we have developed here. So this is a biopsy, for instance. You have a sample and you look uh, the cells uh, uh, and you determine the, if there are a cancer here or not and the grading of that. And the issue is that, of course, the cancer maybe is not in all the prostate. So when you take a sample, if you are lucky with quotes, you can uh, take a sample with the cancer, but you can take a sample where there is not a cancer while the patient has a cancer. So you don't know that it's a, 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 an exam which is not very sensitive and you want to uh, improve that. Okay, so very often when you have a uh, negative biopsy and the patient has still stem symptoms, you uh, have to uh, make again biopsy and see uh, if, if they are a cancer or not and so on. And that's also many patients. So to do that, in fact, uh, people use uh, ultrasound images. So the prostate, you ca can see it uh, like here and you introduce the ultrasonic probe into the rectum and you have this kind of image and you have to take samples from this kind of information. The difficulty of that is that in general the cancer is not visible in the ultrasound image. So generally people make a kind of systematic sampling they try to take as much. There are some uh, standard protocols in France uh, that people use 12 core protocol. So you try to put your 12 uh, things as regularly as possible in the prostate, but you only use uh, the image that you see here. So you see it's difficult to see in 3D to see where you are 
when you move the ultrasound uh, probe, you move the prostate, so you, uh, you introduce uh, errors. Also, sometimes patient had uh, an MR and you see a target here, and you have to say, okay, the target is here in my 3D image. Where is it in my ultrasound? How can I get it? So the clinician, again, has to make some image fusion mentally, and he has to be a very good ability to represent uh, things in 3D and have a, a good hand-eye coordination. Because this is very difficult, okay, we'll, we will not go into the detail of the method, but what we developed uh, in, in Grenoble in collaboration with the La, La Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital in Paris and the Grenoble Hospital, was a method where you record uh, a 3D ultrasound volume at the beginning of the uh, biopsy. And afterwards, each time you move the probe and you want to get a biopsy, you record another volume. And I will just make a drawing. So you have a reference volume. And after, during the biopsy, you will have another volume with the prostate in other, the position. And what you want to do is to be able to find the correspondence between each element here and each element of the reference here, so that when you get a sample here, you know where it is here. And afterwards, you take another volume, and again, you make the correspondence. And so if you take a biopsy here, you know where it is here. Okay? And so you are able to build a 3D map of what you are doing. So I will skip the, uh, the formula. But you can see here, um, I, I will explain just a little bit. Uh, here, we, you will see it will move here. You have two of these volume. We put them uh, together before we find the correspondence and after we find the correspondence. So, if it wants to start, uh -oh. it does not start, I'm sorry. Okay. You see, if I stop, when the, the user moves this cursor in the middle, you go from one volume to the other, and you see that there are deformation. The prostate uh, that you can uh, imagine here and here is really not in the same position and not with the same orientation. And in some image, it is much more compressed than in the other image. So if I continue, it's before the program is running. You see the prostate, you see very different image. And after, after registration, you have determined this function that allows to map one volume to the other, and you see that there is an almost perfect correspondence between the two volumes. And what is interesting is that it is totally automatic and with no uh, real uh, intervention of the clinician to get the results. Okay, we evaluated that, I skipped that, but it was an important uh, uh, stage of the research to be able to, uh, to uh, prove that the accuracy of the correspondence was good enough to be usable in practice. And afterwards, during the, the, the evaluation, we provided this kind of uh, images to the clinician. So the prostate is ear, 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 etc., ear. You can see it, uh, and you can see that the sampling that the clinician uh, did are not optimal because here uh, nothing has been taken. Here in the middle, nothing has been taken. Here, uh, everything is in the same region. And that was really interesting because uh, this visualization, it was the first time that the clinician had the information about what they did. Before, what they had, in practice, they had this kind of drawing on a, on a paper, and they say to the nurse, OK, I take this sample. So they put it, it's uh, number one, it's this sample. But in reality, you don't know if it is here or here or here. So it was really interesting because it was the first time that they had some feedback about their, uh, their uh, gesture. 
And uh, what was also interesting is that with one of the operator, we had a collection of uh, testing like that, and even only the visualization after the gesture, without any assistance during the gesture, improved his, uh, his ability to be uh, accurate because he had this visual feedback and so he could improve from the first patient to the uh, following patient. So we decided that it could be really interesting to use all the exams that we have recorded to build a simulator. So we have this kind of device with this object which mimics the ultrasound probe and when the operator moves this object, it computes the image from the database, and so he can uh, play with that. And so we have uh, developed a, a really a, a, um, a simulator with uh, some specific exercise to be able to understand uh, image, ultrasound image, and to provide assistance, specific assistance, depending on the result of the training. <laughs> And so at the end, we, we finished with a system like that. We have modified many things, but OK, I, I don't go into the details, but it's a, a still a work in progress. All these, uh, these image processing uh, tools, as I said, were developed in collaboration with uh, clinicians, but also it will be in the context of uh, CIFR PhD grants. So it's uh, in uh, collaboration also with the company. And at the end, in fact, those uh, software that we developed were embedded in a, in a, in a system named Eurostation. And this is the last version. And so they sell the system to guide the biopsy. And they also uh, um, made some uh, uh, industrialization of other tools that we developed for image processing. Okay, I skip that because I'm a little long. Uh, so let's skip to another. Uh, here it was for uh, uh, diagnostic. We have other activities concerning treatment, and one is uh, brachytherapy. So brachytherapy, you put radioactive seeds that looks like that into the prostate of the patient. So it's a radiotherapy, but instead of having a system sending X-rays from the outside, the X-ray comes from the inside. You put permanent seed, here it's iodine uh, seeds, that have a, a short half-life, and you keep them, and uh, the, where you place them, of course, depend on which treatment you want to deliver. And this is based also on ultrasound images. And you can see that the seeds here are inserted through needles, which are inserted through an, uh, uh, this kind of template. It's like a, a naval battle. You say A1, B2. And you have to place different uh, needles with very precise uh, uh, positions. And the way you, you, you determine the positions is based on some dose planning. So again, I said it's like radiotherapy. You have to deliver a certain dose, which is a standard uh, delivery for some kind of patient. So here, let's say it's uh, uh, 160 gray. And you know that the prostate should receive at least uh, this, at, uh, at most that, and that the rectum and the urethra must receive low dose. And so you have some planning of that. And at the end, you see the seeds lo looks like that if you take an X-ray of, uh, of the, the patient afterwards. And that's a little bit difficult to do that for many reasons. Uh, some of them are related to the fact that uh, the images you have seen, the ultrasounds, are not very easy to manage. But also, you can have also the collision of needles with the bone that you cannot see in the US image. And you have plenty of inaccuracy that comes, for instance, from the edema when you insert needles with radioactive seeds. The uh, prostate inflates during the treatment. And before, between the beginning of the uh, treatment and the end, which lasts two hours, something like that, the, the prostate can increase of about 20 of 30% of its volume. So that means that the planning that you have made at the beginning is no longer uh, possible, no longer correct, because the prostate has, uh, has increased. You have also uh, things related to the fact that uh, 
uh, you push on the prostate, so you compress it. So when you put your, your seeds here and you release the probe, the seeds are like that and so on. And th there is also the deflection of the needles, which are rigid, but not so rigid than this, and which can uh, deflect because they are quite long. So at the end, you have, instead of having a perfect lines of seeds, you may have clusters of seeds and some seeds like that or like that. And so we developed uh, many assistants to do that, to help that. First, uh, we developed image processing tools, so I will not go into the details, but uh, uh, some of them were also transferred to the company uh, to, to make the treatment of uh, the ultrasound or MR images uh, uh, easier. But uh, we also developed a robot uh, that you can see here. I will just show you a, a, a small video so that you see the, the movement of that. In fact, this robot allows, to, you have seen in the template, you have a collection, a, a discrete number, a finite number of possible trajectories uh, through the template uh, with, uh, with discrete uh, position. With the robot, you can make any position and you can also orient the needle, so that gives uh, much more freedom. But what is most important is that this system is uh, uh, connected with image processing like for the biopsy. That means that when you insert the needles into the prostate, there are some deformation and motion of the prostate. And using this kind of software, you can compute how the prostate has moved or has been deformed, and you can correct for it automatically with the robot. Okay, so we have made a, I will just show you a small video to, so that you see, it's not, uh, it's on plastic uh, things, so don't worry. Okay, you can see the robot, it's not so good. You see the robot here, the needle is here, and the prostate, of, uh, a dummy of the prostate was there. I will skip the image processing so that we go faster. And you can see here the insertion of the needle into the prostate. And you can see that when you push, the prostate deforms and moves. And so image processing here also, uh, allows to, to make the correction so that we can uh, compensate for error. I skip uh, again, it's okay. Okay, so as you can see, this is really a lab prototype. Okay, it's not uh, obviously usable in practice. So we have developed, uh, we have continued this project and we have developed a version to be used into the operating room. So based on the experiments, we developed another version which was more rigid, safer with uh, some uh, uh, st standard of development for, uh, that can uh, fit the regulations and where you can uh, uh, detect the risk and so on. And so we are in the process of trying to starting a clinical trial on a few pa pa patients with this uh, system. Uh, we also work with uh, other teams on uh, other subjects. Like I, I said that the edema is uh, the inflation of the prostate uh, due to the inflammatory effect. And so we try to model it using finite element m models, poroelastic model, so that we can consider that for those calculation because uh, when you put the seeds, they are somewhere with a certain configuration of the prostate, but it moves, and so you have to take this into account. Finally, just a project that is uh, also uh, uh, currently running. Uh, it's what is called needle steering. When you, you see the needles, many of them have a, a bevel tip like that, and when you have this kind of uh, needles, in fact, naturally, it, it moves not in the in straight line, but there is a curvature which is due to the reaction force on the tip of the uh, of the of the of the needle. And so, okay, it's a drawback, but it can be an advantage because imagine that you have the bevel tip 
that allows you to go that uh, direction. If you turn the needle, you can go in that direction. And so if you are able to plan this with a straight needle, you can make curved trajectory. And so you can compensate for inaccuracy again uh, in the delivery of seeds. Okay, I will not go into the details, but of course it's difficult because you have to detect automatically the, the, bevel, the needles into the ultrasound images, and it's, uh, it's uh, difficult to make it robust, so we develop many things uh, based on some uh, prediction uh, of the deformation and the motion. And at the end, we, uh, we made some uh, experiments and we are in, also in the process of uh, continuing this project. Okay, to conclude, just you have seen that uh, it's uh, really an interdisciplinary uh, domain with scientific questions, clinical objectives, and somewhere we have to deal with industrial partners to make a uh, system which are usable in clinics. And of course, you have regulation, ethical issues uh, on top of that, that you have to, uh, to uh, respect. So we have worked in many different uh, clinical domains. The list is not important, it's just to show you that many of the approach that we developed have some genericity and we can afterwards try uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to imagine how some tools, basic tools can be uh, improved to fit some uh, other problems. So we have many, many of these applications. The blue one are the one where we had some industrial partnership that uh, produced some uh, products. And so many patients treated by the system, with the system. And we have many of the, uh, uh, of the project that we have conducted where we uh, had uh, people uh, that started companies that uh, make the industrial dissemination of our work. So you see uh, a number of them since uh, 1995 to uh, uh, some years ago. And some of them uh, built product out of our research and they, there are some agreements and some royalties that goes back to the lab for new research. So that's a kind of a nice uh, loop. Uh, and that's it. Just uh, in conclusion, you have seen plenty of uh, questions, interesting things, which are uh, related to real problems, real clinical problems. And there are still many uh, challenges, scientific sh uh, challenges, but also challenges due uh, to the clinical evaluation and to the transfer of these techniques to uh, clinical routine. Okay, and that's it. And I thank you if you have any question. So, so perhaps you could tell us a bit, uh, so, so who has the idea, so you, there is the clinician, there is you, there are the people maybe doing the machines, who has the ideas first and how does it work to, to create something? It, de uh, in, it depends on the case. Sometimes it's in a discussion with clinician because uh, as you have probably understood, it's a long-term collaboration that we have uh, with clinicians. So we see very often, we meet very often for different discussions, different projects. And sometimes, okay, uh, something arrives in the conversation and uh, the clinicians say, okay, I have this problem. Uh, do you think that you could help to solve it? So sometimes it's pure R&D, so it's not our program, but sometimes it, it puts a scientific question and it, it can be. Uh, in other cases, uh, as I said, some of the guys in the lab are clinicians, or myself, I have been a, a member of the urology department during three years, so every uh, Thursday morning I went to the staff meeting uh, in the urology department. And so knowing a little bit more about uh, the clinical uh, outcomes, you can also imagine uh, something useful, but of course you have to discuss with the clinician to know if it is uh, uh, something promising or not, because uh, the worst thing is to invent something without discussing to clinician with clinician and to solve a problem which is not a problem, in fact. Edouard. Merci. 
One of your last slides said that several thousand patients, maybe more, have been operated with your techniques. Uh, can you, this is a large, large number, so can you say what the benefit compared to patients who have not been operated with such techniques? The previous one. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, for, for each of the, the systems, we had some clinical evaluation. For instance, uh, one is ACL. ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament, so it's a disease in the knee. And the problem is to uh, put, the, uh, uh, to replace the ligament in the right position. And so you can compare uh, patients which have been operated with the, left, uh, the, the help of the system compared to patients which has, uh, are operated in the standard way. And you can uh, see that the ligament is placed in a better position. And in the long term, you can also characterize the issue. Is there any prosthesis after any other problems? So you, for each of these systems, and this is the, the, the clinical part of the work, you not only have to show that your robot is accurate and so on, but you have to show that it is useful from the clinical point of view. And that's uh, an issue that we have also to, to demonstrate with the clinicians. So, uh, for instance, for prostate biopsy, you can show that you are able to, uh, to, to, to have a better uh, level of uh, detection of the cancer because you are guided using uh, these MR images. Or, there, okay, the, the criteria is different for any of the for each of the uh, of the clinical application, but that's an, an important uh, question that you need to answer. Uh, if you want to, that your system are used in clinical practice. So I have a question very close to Professor Brezin, uh, one, uh, which is uh, what about the state of the art in the world? I mean, in two, in two levels. The level, for instance, in urology like yours at the last uh, mm -hmm. part of your talk and generally speaking you have plenty of uh, developments of uh, uh, tele-operation by, by in the, for instance in cardiology or, or any kind of uh, surgery today yeah, so sure. could you give yeah, us an this, idea uh, the, the kind of thing that I just mentioned to you are the worldwide uh, State, uh, okay, I have explained a, th a system that we develop, uh, many, but it corresponds to worldwide state of the art. Uh, in terms of urology, uh, the thing that we developed was really pioneer in that domain. Afterwards, you have seen, uh, I have shown you the Da Vinci robot, which has been developed by a company something like 20 years ago. Now they have sold four, 5,000 of these systems worldwide. So, uh, okay, in that case, it's also a kind of state-of-the-art uh, clinics. But concerning the research uh, in Grenoble, but also in uh, other places in France, in Paris, in Brittany, in Montpellier, in Strasbourg, there are really groups which are at the top level uh, uh, with respect to the, the, the worldwide state-of-the-art. And many, of, okay, I've not uh, spoken of cardiovascular application, but for instance, we have uh, colleagues in Rennes in a, labo, uh, in a lab named uh, LTSI, which really develop many things to guide the placement of stent uh, based on some X-ray imaging using augmented reality and uh, biomechanical models. So uh, French, uh, French labs in that domain are really uh, in the top uh, level. Uh, How long does it take from what you do at the lab to be able to, I mean, put in practice at, by the clinician? Do you need, I mean, you talked about ethics, but is it like f with the medicines that you have all these trials before you are yeah, able yeah, yeah. to go and use it? And yeah, so how sure. long does it take? It can take a really a while. It really depends on the project because sometimes the, the, re the research itself can already take long. Uh, for instance, the work about uh, image processing for urology here, it, it took uh, four 
to five years to, to do the things uh, really to, to develop the right method to uh, evaluate them and so on on a, practi on a scientific level. And afterwards you need okay, to make some kind of clinical evaluation provided that you have ethical uh, rules and regulations and files to fill and so on. And sometimes you do not have any industrial partnership or uh, sometimes it's not a market neither. I have worked for uh, some years ago uh, about some um, heart uh, intervention, which is uh, not a very frequent one when people have what is called a, uh, I don't know the English word, but uh, you get liquid into the pericardium and you have to puncture it. And so it's uh, something really critical because when you puncture, you can uh, kill your patient. So it's critical, but it's a few patients per year per hospital. So even if you uh, developed interesting things, maybe it's not interesting for some industrial partner. So sometimes things stop. But okay, it can, it can last long. Uh, I said, the, for instance, for the prostate things, I think the first uh, conversation that I had with the urologist with whom we developed that was in uh, something like uh, uh, 2003. And uh, the company was created something like five years uh, later. And now, they, uh, uh, this evening, they are uh, making a kind of party for their 10th uh, birthday. And there are 20, uh, 30 people in, uh, in the company. And, uh, and okay, they sell uh, this uh, system for several years now. But you see, it can take long. Yes. Well, one last question. This relies heavily on image fusion, registration, yeah. and ultimately adaptation to patient-oriented models. So what is the strategy in your group and worldwide? Is it to have massively implemented computation on board the station, or do you uh, resort to uh, clusters in some computer uh, uh, it depends Lab. if you want to make only one paper uh, using a huge uh, number of computer powers and so on uh, working to solve it. It can be uh, that you use that. After generally what we try to do is to, uh, to, to, to develop solutions that are uh, tractable in practice so that don't require, for instance, uh, 20 years ago, we had a massive computer that had several uh, thousands of uh, small uh, uh, CPU. But of course, in practice, you can use that for research, but you cannot imagine that in practice it can be usable. So in general, we try not only to solve a problem, but to solve a problem in a way that can be uh, uh, realistic in clinical practice that may put some uh, hard constraint with respect to man-machine interaction with the time uh, spent with robustness with many things and it tries other scientific questions due to that. Well, so thank you very much, uh, Jocelyne. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.